Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, Margaret Stanton is going to talk to us about Doctrine or ORM. So. Oh, okay. Um, so hi, I'm Margaret Stanton. I'm talking about Doctrine or today. Um, this is not my laptop and this is not my projector, but we're going to figure it out. Because these aren't my slides, so hopefully that's the important part. Okay, uh, my name is Margaret. I like elephants and daisies. These will be recurrent themes. I have been working with Doctrine mostly as part of the Symphony 2 framework for about four years now. Uh, the Symphony 2 framework did just become the Symphony 3 framework, but it's basically the same framework and it does still have uh, Doctrine as one of the default settings in it, so kind of ignore that one. Okay, so I've been developing a social strategy city builder RPG of awesomeness. It's at brewgame.com. It's an open beta. You can play it now. And this is how I learned how to use Doctrine because I used Symphony for it. And Doctrine is part of the state of the package. So I was like, why not? I'll figure this out. Okay, so this is what we're going to cover today. Overview, installation, free structure, basic interactions, complex queries, custom repositories, life cycle events, and then we will take questions. Although I may try and stop partway through to see if you have any questions in the interim because sometimes it can get a little overwhelming to cover a lot of ground in short period of time. And so if you have a question on your mind, I might stop and take it. So if you just think of one and put your hand up, I will probably ask you what it is. Okay. So if you don't know, um, a doctrine is an ORM object relational mapping that is basically where you take a relational database and you transmogify it into objects because we have all been taught object uh, oriented programming and so being able to think about a database as if it was objects can be really useful for that. Um, this is how your app will think about stored information. Um, it reasons with the database on behalf of your application. And it is part of the Symphony Standard Edition. That is still true, even though this is Symphony 3 now and not Symphony 2. It is still part of the Symphony Standard Edition framework install. OK, so we're going to uh, talk, go through installation. We're going to make some assumptions, like I'm going to assume that you know how to set up a local web server. And I'm also going to assume that it's the same local web server that I have set up so that I don't have to worry about everybody's individual little setup. So I'm going to assume that you have stack. Because I have stack. All right, we are going to talk about installing with Composer. If you are not familiar with Composer, Composer is the dependency manager for PHP. It is super easy to install, it is super easy to work with, and once you have tried it out, you will realize that your life is so much easier now to use Composer. Please use Composer. If you're not familiar with it, go to getcomposer.org and see the super, super helpful, very, very simple documentation. Okay, so there are two different ways that you that I'm going to cover installing Doctrine. One of them is just by installing Symphony Standard Edition because it's part of that, and the other one is standalone. So we're going to go through both processes, and you can do whatever works for you. Um, this is how you would go about using Composer to install Symphony Standard Edition. Now that there is Symphony 3, there is a second way to install Symphony using its installer, which you can find on their in their docs, which is just a different way to do basically the same thing. But, you know, Composer, all of the things, so this is the way to install Symphony with Composer. I've broken it down into multiple lines. This is actually just one command, but I've broken it down into multiple lines for readability's sake. Basically, you're just using PHP to run Composer.far, create project, Symphony, Framework Standard Edition, and then the path to your web root. That's not a real path, it's just whatever the path to your web root is, and then the name of your project. And when you do this, Composer will very helpfully ask you a series of questions that it will use to create a parameters of so YML file that will be the parameters that are overarching for your project. Um, in blue, I've highlighted the ones that you definitely want to go ahead and fill in. Everything else, you can actually just take the default on and it will be fine. So just like hit enter except for the ones in blue and then make sure those are correct. Now, uh, the second option as to how to install Docker is a standalone. We're still using Composer, um, only we're going to just use the Composer require command, which is super useful. Basically, the require command uh, just takes whatever package you tell it to require, and it adds that into your composer.json and installs it. So we're installing uh, Doctrine using PHP, composer.far, require, Doctrine, slash form, star, and the star is actually a version. If you would like a very specific version, you can put a very specific version in there instead of the star. If you just put in the star, it will do whatever is the newest. Okay, so um, 
Um, now that we've, we're still on the standalone one, um, so part of the standalone one is you need to go ahead and include the autoloader. Um, that uh, vendor slash autoload.php, that is relative to the project group. Um, and yeah, you should try that once. Um, and then you also need to set up your entity manager. Symphony does this for you, but if you're doing it, as, if you're using the doctrine in a standalone way in, as, in a project that's not part of Symphony, you need to go ahead and set up the entity manager by creating a file called bootstrap.php. Um, you're going to need to uh, use the ORM tool setup, entity manager, uh, pass, that's uh, the path to the entity files, is device mode false, this is just a basic setup that tells it where your database is and the login information for it so that it can use that perpetually while interacting with the database on your behalf. Um, and then there's a good face up. All this is going to be linked on the joined in, so if you want to reference the specific code that I have on these slides, that should be very easy. You'll just go to the joined in and there will be a link to the slides there. So any of this stuff will be very easy to reference later. I know it's kind of hard in this mode. Okay. Um, and then we also want to set up the command line tool because the command line tool with Doctrine is super, super useful because you just run some commands and it will update the structure of your database based on some files that we're going to talk about how to make later. But you definitely want to go ahead and set up the command line tool. Again, this is something, something that Symphony does automatically for you, but if you're using Doctrine on its own, you want to go ahead and set it up. So you're going to make a new file called cli-config.php. And you can see that it's really, really super easy to set up. It's very simple. You just need to put in some basic information, require once the bootstrap.php that you just made, um, and so it can make a new entity manager, and you've got your console runner, and you send it your entity manager, and you're all done. Uh, and here at the bottom, if you want to read more in any detail about any of this, doctrine-orm.readthedocs.org, all of the docs are there, very detailed, but it's, I find that it's a lot easier to get started with something if you start with an overview, and then you can dig down into the docs when you have specific questions. So that's what we're here. Okay, so creating the structure of your project's database. We're, because, it's a, because it's an ORM, what we're doing is we're going to create objects that describe how we want the data stored in our database, and then Doctrine's going to set that up in the database for us. So what we're doing is we're making entities. That's what we're calling our objects that are going to translate into structures in the database. Uh, so they describe the structure of a database table, and they also hold methods for interacting with data from records in that table. Okay, so here's what one looks like. This is how uh, the other structure is very simple. You uh, go ahead and use the, the back end. I use uh, annotations. Um, for this, you can see you're calling out ORM at the beginning of these annotations, so it knows that these are special instructions that we're to implement. At the top, you see we're declaring that it's an entity. The second annotation that we're using, we're telling it what the table name will be. This is going to be item. Uh, and then we are making a class named item, and this class, its annotations are going to describe what the database table is going to look like. So we're, well, I basically start off all of mine the same way, which is with an ID, and we're going to tell it to auto-generate uh, an integer value for that ID. Now here's some uh, here's some more examples of uh, annotations that describe different field types that you might want included in one of your objects. Uh, like we're going to make a, a value name, and we're going to tell it that this is a column, and it's of a type string, and we're going to give it a length of 64. Um, and then we've got uh, another we've got another column that's a value and it's typed decimal and it's a scale of two and that means that it's going to track up to two values past the decimal point. Um, and then we've got another one called available and it's going to be an integer and one of the reasons the reason that we put that in there is so that I can show you that there is a option you can put in, which is nullable equal true, which is very useful. If you don't put in nullable equal true, then if you try it and save it without a value in this field, then it's going to throw an error. Um, but if you want to be able to, if it's an optional value, if you want to be able to have it nulled out, you just add that nullable equal true um, as just like you would a scale or a length value. Um, and then at the bottom, we've got um, an attribute value, and we're telling it that it's a type array. Um, yes. Can you assign default values in here? You yes, you absolutely can assign default values here. Uh, you just put an equal sign and the value next to it, and it will consider that the default value. Okay. Yeah. Which can be super useful. 
Um, okay, so um, the type array, obviously, um, I'll not <laughs> databases don't necessarily by default have an array type. A doctrine will pretend that it does for you. It'll turn that into a blob and it'll do all the processing to put that into the uh, type that the database can store and pull it back out into a PHP array for you, which is super useful. I mean, yes, you could write the code to do that yourself, but you don't have to. You can just tell it it's an array type and it knows what that means and it does that work for you. Okay, so there you can also do simple associations. Uh, here's a uh, one to one. All of my examples you might notice are from gaming because that's what I've been doing for the last four years. So, like, we are going to be working with a character class, which, like, is a game character. And so it might have an adventure class, and that might be a one to one connection. So, we're going to join the class ID to the ID in the adventure class table. Um, okay, so here's a bidirectional association. Yes. Um, so I dabbled a bit in Doctrine One, and at that time it seemed like there was a lot of tools for some. Some people are more comfortable kind of doing the data structure and then going to the code. So you used to be able to generate from the data. So if you have an existing database, can you generate this stuff off of it, or do you have to write this? I never tried to do it that direction, so I don't know. I've yeah. been told yes. He's been told one. yes. Let's go with that. I was just curious. So that may or may not be wrong. Because it seemed like they changed their paradigm into it. Okay. They went more I don't first. know, and um, the, the reason that I'm extra not sure about it is because one of the big points of uh, doctrine or really uh, any any or any any tool that's supposed to put like, a distance between you and your database is the idea. I don't know that it always works this way, but the idea that you could change database types without having to change any interac interactions with your database. Uh, you can just you just you just swap swap out the 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 type is supposed to be like super easy and simple and I've never done it so I can't vouch for that. But you're supposed to be able to just swap out what kind of database type you're using and all of the mapping will be exactly the same. And so it's like a one line change, supposedly. So like I don't I don't know I don't that what you're describing sounds so very tied to an existing database that I'm not sure it still accommodates that into, but if he says he's heard it, then maybe they've got tools for that. Okay, so you can also do uh, bidirectional mapping. So we've got a character, and we're going to uh, we're going to link one character to one mount. And here's the other side of that bidirectional, which is bidirectional. Uh, and we're going to uh, link the mount back to the character, so you can get back and forth between the two. Very simple, straightforward. Okay, um, and here is just showing you that you can do self-referencing. So if you want to link a character uh, object to another character object, say for instance a character has a, another character that is its sovereign, you can link you can link it just by doing a um, you can have the target entity be the same entity, um, and it will reference the sovereign ID to an ID of another record of the same type. So that's totally possible. Uh, and you can also do many to one. Here's a unidirectional uh, many to one. Say you can have many, many characters in one region. Um, and you can also do uh, one to many bidirectional. So you can have um, you can have one you can have one user be linked to many, many characters. And that you you can see that part of doing this is uh, constructing an array of characters as part of that user object. And here is the other set of that, where you've got um, many, many characters linked to a single user. Okay, so console commands. Um, on the console commands, they are slightly different depending on whether you're using Doctrine as part of Symfony or whether you're using Doctrine as standalone. So I'm going to show you both. Um, you can see here that I've got the Symfony logo, and that is to indicate to you that this is the Symfony version of this command. That this is something you would put on the command line, you would. Uh, say PHP app console, I'm going to have to do a caveat here. It's app console in Symphony 2. It's bin console in Symphony 3. Very small change, you probably want to be aware of that. Okay, so uh, PHP app console, doctrine schema, update force. I know force is a scary word, especially when you're on a command line, but um, I've never really broken anything with this, so it's fine. Probably. <laughs> Maybe don't do a production. Uh, all right, so. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> so basically what this does is um, Dr. will go through all of your annotated entities and it will make your database look like what you have described in those entities, including any changes that you have made. If you have dropped columns, it will remove those columns. If you add columns, it will add those columns. It's very useful like that. Okay, and you can also have it generate getters and setters for you, which is really nice because then you don't have to like wear your hands out and get purple tunnel typing the same thing 50,000 times. So you can do PHP app console docker and generate entities and it will do all of the get this set that for you, which is a great place to start. Yes, it is awesome to modify those things later. Yes? Is docker like remove columns and stuff too? Yes. Like, yes. Okay. Yes. That scares me. I know, right? <laughs> it's powerful. So make a backup. Always. Do, do I need to mention that in this stuff? Make backups. <laughs> make make like yeah. Do version control. You're all using Git, right? That, I mean that's not this talk. But use Git. Like come on. Yeah. Does it? Uh, and maybe a bit ahead of it. Does it generate migrations when you make a change like that? I know Docker has a migration system. Yes. Yes. Um, so it does. So that way. You would be able to roll back changes. I don't know about that. I don't know. All right. Well, I think you can. So you can roll back structure, but not. Yeah. Well, yeah. Obviously, your data is gone. Yeah. So you're gonna want to run it down before you do that for sure. Yeah. 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 yeah absolutely. <laughs> back up your data. That's just that's a good rule, huh? Okay. So uh, and, and here we do the same thing only with a standalone Docker install. Uh, it's very, it, as you can see, it is very, very similar. Uh, so to update uh, the database based on all of the entities that we've annotated, we now are going to use PHP, vendor, bin, doctrine, or schema, dash, tool, update, force. Almost, but not quite the exact same thing as before. So if you get confused, just remember that they're slightly different and look up the one for whatever you're trying to do, and it's probably like two characters off from what you were trying already. And same thing with getters and setters, there's an almost identical command for a standalone install, which is PHP vendor bin doctrine form generate entities. Now we have getters and setters. This is what a generated getter looks like. Yay. So we're looking at our class user, and you can see that get name will return this name, just like you would expect, only you didn't have to type it. How awesome is that? Um, here's a generated setter. As you would expect, you send the setter a string and it sets name to that string. Okay, now we can also modify these because they are not set in stone. They are yours for the changing. So let's say that you want it to be more specific than just a string. You want it to be only one of a particular finite set of strings. Well, you can put, uh, you can put an array of of strings that are acceptable there, and you can check whatever tries to be set against it, and you can set it to that if it's in the array, and if not, you can set it to some random default value, or you can send back an error, or you can stand on your head, basically whatever you want to do, because you're writing code. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about accessing the entity manager, because now we've got Dr. McConnell's entities, so let's like use them in our code for stuff. So, um, here, you notice the Symphony logo. That means we are talking about the Symphony-specific version of this. So we're looking at a Symphony controller and how we would access the uh, entity manager from inside a Symphony controller. And we would do that by using um, this get doctrine, get manager, because they've got these super handy little methods already set up, because they assume you're going to want to do this all over the place, because you are. Um, and then in you know, command, it is very slightly different in that you need to get the container and then get the doctrine service, because this get and then the parentheses and the name, that's just simply standard way of getting a service from the service container. Yay. Um, and then get manager default. So uh, similar, not exactly the same, but you can you can definitely access the entity manager from a controller or the command, just slightly different. If it's throwing an error, just look it up. It's probably just made a very slight error because they're slightly different. Okay, so um, in a, if you want to access the, uh, Entity Manager in a service, you have to go ahead and pass the Entity Manager to that service. It doesn't assume that you're going to want anything in a service that you don't specifically say, send this to the service. So in the service definitions, you would add the Entity Manager with the app doctrine that, that tells it which package to look at because it's named somewhere else, um, dot org, dot entity underscore manager. And then in the service, you can then call it because it's going to be passed into the constructor. You can assign it to whatever name you want to be able to access it from from now. 
Um, and then now you see that we have changed to the Dr. Examilone logo, which means we're going to talk about the exact same thing, only not in a symphony at all. Uh, so we've got our bootstrap file. And you can see that here at the bottom of our bootstrap file, which we talked about at the beginning of the talk, uh, we have now assigned the entity manager create with our connection and our config to the variable and that we can now use EDM, you know, just like we assigned it in the Symphony stuff, and now once we're assigned to that like long access string of services, we can just use that EDM over and over and over again. This is how we do that, which is to standalone. So we assign it to Entity Manager, Create, with the connection and configuration. Okay, so uh, let's look at any questions before we move on. Yes, no? Yes? Is every database connection at its own? There is a one-line config thing where you change what uh, what database you're using and everything else is the same as far as I know. That is my understanding as to being the big part. Yeah. Is there a is there a way to change databases in, in the middle? Like. Yeah, it's a one-line config change. Uh, well, no, that's not what I, I, what I mean. In the middle of I mean in the middle of running the script, you want to access one database, then you want to access another. one. I'm sure I could figure out how to do that. No, I don't know off the top of my head how it would. But yeah, I'm sure, yeah, I'm, sure, yeah, I'm absolutely sure you could do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So setting up a new uh, version of an entity. So uh, we're just gonna we're just gonna it's just an object. So you call new item and then we remember we set up our getters and setters. So we're just gonna use that here. We're going to set name, set type, set amount, and then the bottom two lines are the important part that we need to know here. Uh, persist the item that we just made and flush. If you don't use, if you don't put in those two lines, nothing will happen. Like it's it's there for as long as you're in that function, but it's just locally created. You haven't actually moved it to the database until you have persisted and flushed it. Okay, so don't forget. Otherwise, you're just making that information locally, and nothing's going to the database. It's ignored. Okay, so. Um, when we get our repository um, in Symphony, we prefix it with the bundle name. Um, so, in like without Symphony, you wouldn't prefix it with the bundle name. You would just call the entity name. But in Symphony, it assumes you might want multiple bundles that are that have different entities and stuff. So you prefix it with the uh, bundle name. So it'd be like my bundle colon item. And if it's not in Symphony, it's just item. It's very, very slight. Um, so there are some handy handy little shortcuts that uh, Doctrine puts in there, like you can get all of the records in a database with the find all method. Um, you can find one by ID and just send in the ID and get the one record with that ID. Um, you can also use the find by method and um, the find by takes an, uh, an associative array where the keys are the names of the columns and the values are the ones that the, the values that you want to match in those columns. Um, these are very handy, especially when you're like first putting together an app. I highly recommend, of course, as you move on that you get more specific calls that actually just get what you want when you want it, but like especially when you're just putting together um, a, an app like really quick because you're just trying to like draft it and see how it works. These are super, super handy because you just like type them out in a second and done and you've got the information you need. Okay, so um, here's just some examples of how you might uh, use an entity like in a controller and the, okay, so here I just want to show how you can like get the existing amount and then add or subtract or multiply or divide or whatever you want to do to that value and then save it all in one line. Very, so you can like get it, manipulate it, save it all right there. Um, and down here, what I, want, what I want to point out to you is that you can um, you can do a bunch of stuff like in a loop or whatever. You can like make a bunch of changes. And if you don't flush it until after all that, if you don't put the flush inside the loop, if instead you put it outside of the loop, Doctrine will try and make that all one call for you instead of like call and call and call and call and call every instance of the loop, which, you know, that's kind of important. Okay, um, now, if you, when you want to get more specific, and you will want to get more specific, then you're going to want to look at um, the Doctrine query build. Now, I do want to stop here for a second and say that Doctrine does not prevent you from making direct calls. You can absolutely write direct database calls after you, you can do the entity thing you can have it set up your getters and setters you can have all of that and when you want to make a specific call you can just use straight sql for that and that's not a problem it will not stop you but 
There's also the query builder, which you can do almost everything that you could do with a straight up query in the query builder. Like, okay, the one thing that I have run into, I'm sure there are other things, but the one thing that I have run into that you can do with a straight query that you can't do with a query builder is like if you want to update a set of records that you need to get with a join, <laughs> Current builder doesn't know how to do that. Yeah, you, you have to write to them. You have to get you have to get the ones that you want to do with the join, and then you can update based on the IDs that you pull from the join select. But most things, most of the time, the query builder can totally do for you. So here we're looking at um, we're gonna uh, you see we're starting with EM. That's our entity manager that we're totally used to now. So we've got the entity manager, and then we're gonna create a query builder. We want to select the slot value from the item that we're calling C, so C slot is referencing the item, and we're going to say where the name is like this this one parameter that we're passing in, and where destroy is null, um, and then where uh, the type is in this array types. And so this is showing off like a variety of different ways that the query builder can do kind of fancy selects for you. Obviously, we can do a straight one-to-one -one matching like we're doing with prefer and name. Um, and, and actually, if I if I wanted to, because I'm using like and not equals, I could put the I could put the uh, percentage line on one or both sides of that, and it would do just like it would in a normal query, to where it will match um, where the the percent sign acts like a wild card, so it will match anything that's like that. And if it were straight equals, it wouldn't do that; it would just match anything that was exactly like that, just like you expect. Um, and then is null null is of course a special value. You can't use normal like equal or or like with null. It has to be is null or is not null. It's null is special. It appears very particular about null. Um, and then the the in and not in I find to be surprisingly useful because I mean you've got an array of types and you want to get all of the data that's either in that array or not matches either either matches something in that array or doesn't match anything in that array. And the um, the expression method is very 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 useful for. Uh, Instances like, instances like that. And then we set our parameters to pass in all the things that we're using for the matching. The uh, distinct, we see the add distinct, that's going to apply to what we're selecting. So we're only going to get distinct slots. We're not going to get repetitions, records that have the same slot. Um, and then we've got uh, order by value, and we're doing descending. Um, and then we're getting the query. And then our slots that we're going to get are going to be the result of them. That's going to return an array. Um, and in each instance of that array, there's going to be um, one key slot with that value. Now, if we weren't getting a specific, if we weren't getting a slot, if we were getting the whole record, um, then we would have actual entity objects that we would need to use, like get this, set that on. But because we're getting a specific uh, value from the record, since we're just getting slot, then it's going to return an associative array with just that uh, particular field or fields if we select multiple ones. So you need to know like if, if you're getting a whole record, you're going to use the getters and setters. If you're returning specific values, it's going to return an associated array. Where, where, is it, where does QB come from? Where's what now? You have a, the expression for the N clause comes from QB. Um, oh, you're right. Oh, I'm so sorry. I need to. Uh, yeah, that's a line I should add in there. Query builder. Yeah, it needs that. It needs that to reference that. And does yeah. that come from the entity manager? No, it comes from a line that I should totally have in this example that I don't. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and fix that after I link this. Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> My bad. All right. Um, okay, so. Oh yeah, I just I just kind of zoomed in on that same thing so that you could maybe like see the bottom a little bit better because it was kind of hard in that longer thing. So if you were to select multiple columns, do you separate them with the space like you would a normal query, or do you chain your selects together like you do with the layer classes? Um. Or can you do both? I think you. I want to say you can do both. I I I think I do it with uh, I think I do it with a uh, with a uh, comma. Comma. I think I do it with like a comma series. Um, but I think I see it with both. The thing is, it's very flexible. I'm actually just showing you the way I do it. But the fact of the matter is, I've seen like three different ways to do most of this stuff. So um, although I'm giving you a map, it's not the 
The map is not the territory. I'm giving you one set of paths that you could get through this stuff with, but there's actually a lot of different ways that you can do most of this stuff. So like that said, like if you run into a situation where what I've told you doesn't quite work for what you want to do, go ahead and look it up. There might be five other ways to do it, one of which actually does what you need it to do. But like, like I said when I was introducing the docs earlier, I find that it's really helpful when picking up a new like tool or piece of technology to get a working overview and then to drill down on like the specifics like as you run into specific needs that don't necessarily match the first tutorial that you saw. So yeah, I'm just showing you how I do it. There are other ways, I promise. Okay, so, oh yeah, so we're just breaking this out, breaking this out further. As you can see, I'm showing an example of how you can use, the, you see I put the percentage signs on either side of the prefer, so now that like, instead of acting like an equal sign, will now act like a, uh, will now look for anything that matches prefer with anything on the left or anything on the right. And if I dropped one of the, the percent signs, then that wild card to drop it would only be whichever side had the percent sign on it. I hope that's good. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so custom repositories are super cool. Um, all that, like, uh, find all, find one by ID, find by an array of values, those are all doctrines. Those are from doctrines, automatic repository that it has for all entities. Those are methods that you can use on enti any entity. But the cool thing about doctrine is that you can also set up your own custom repositories that are attached to a very specific entity that just work for that entity that do special work that you might need to do 15,000 times, not want to have to type out every single time. Instead, you can just put it in the entity, and then you can reference it, reference it off of that entity as if it were one of Doctrine's default methods. So this is how you can set that up. You remember our uh, character entity from before. Before it just said that it was a core entity and that its table name was character. Now we've added a third annotation line to that initial declaration. And what we're telling it is that there is a special custom repository for this entity. So we're telling it that the entity has a repository class and then we're telling it where that repository class is and what its name is, and we're going to name it character repository because, you know, naming things what they are is useful. Okay, so now we're going to create the repository that we just declared in that entity. So we're going to put it where we told the entity it would be, and then we're going to name it what we told the entity we name it, and we're going to extend the entity repository. That's where all of the doctrine's default uh, methods are. We're going to extend that so that we don't lose the one adding the other. Custom functions go here. Okay, so here's an example of something that you might want to have be a custom uh, repository function for a specific entity. Say, I would like to get, um, I'm, I'm going to make an adventure class repository for my adventure class entity. And I'm going to make a custom repository method called get class IDs by class type, and I'm going to give it a type. And then it's going to get the uh, entity manager, and it's going to build a query that selects IDs from the adventure class uh, table that match the type that I just gave it, and then return the result. So yeah, it, it's pretty simple, and you could just put this whole query every time you wanted a set of IDs that match a specific class type, but why? Why not just put it the once and then just reference it, with, and then all you have to do is, I might have done yeah, now all you have to do is anytime you have the adventure class um, entity pulled out with the get repository um, adventure class, now you can just get class by ID, feed it the type, and now it's a lot easier to read and you don't have that big query every single time you just want to get an array of IDs that match the type. Right? Can you not just put that function in the, in the same object? So I mean, is this something? Is this something that we're in? That are you, are you saying this is something that would be used in multiple uh, objects, or is it just being used in this one object? It's okay, so the entity is separate. Okay, you. Okay, so you created the entity, right? Where you describe what you want the entity to look like, but that's not actually that's not dealing with any data. That's just like a that's just like a blueprint. Um, so you can't actually you can't actually pull queries or anything from inside an entity. Um, so you're, you're just describing what the, what the table is going to look like and what the object is going to do when you pull it in, out in other places. Um, so for instance, like in Symfony, I would set up the entity 
in the entity directory, I would set up the repository in the repository director, and then I would reference that in all of the places that I actually do the logic work of the app, like say in a service or in a command or in a controller. Um, does that make sense? Or? That makes sense. Okay. If you have further questions. Okay. Okay, so um, here's another example of something that you might want to make a custom repository function for. So like get top 10 by class type and just key the class type. And then from the character object, it checks and makes sure that it only gets active characters. Um, and then where the class ID is and the class IDs, um, matching the type, because we did that before. Um, and then it sets the it sets the class IDs, um, and then it orders by level of sending, and then match results 10. How useful is that? Top 10, and then it gives you back the top 10 classes by the type, and you can just reference that in a single line. And it's just okay, so think about maybe you're working on an app with more than one person working on that. <laughs> Say you're, you know, a, you, you make this, and then somebody that's just making pretty pages, they can just pull this with like a single, I would just want the top 10 by class type, and they just type that out, and they send the class type, and then they get back the data, and they never need to worry about how. They don't even need to know anything about databases, and they can just get that data and feed it into a template and make it pretty, and then everybody's happy. Yeah. All right, so customer repository functions can be accessed anywhere that you have an instance manager. Um, so you can ask, like, so, this is just that's what that would look like. See, instead of that big long query, which might confuse somebody that just wants to make your templates pretty, you can instead just have a one-liner that's just, I've got the character repository, now I can just get top 10 by class type and then give it the type, like say, the top 10 rangers in the game. And now I have a list of the top 10 rangers in the game, and I can make it this awesome like top 10 list, and it's going to look gorgeous, and it has the right characters in it, and I never need to understand how my database works yet. Okay, so the other, another cool thing that you can do with Doctrine is automatic changes based on things that happen. Um, such as, so all right, so this is has lifecycle callbacks is another uh, annotation that you can tell it that an entity has, which means that it's going to check um, on these lifecycle events whether or not it has a function that it should execute on that lifecycle event. Okay. So they can be set up to trigger on insert, update, delete, or other things that happen with entities. So uh, for example, say you have um, an updated on um, value for a record. Um, you, maybe you want to enter that by hand every time, but maybe you don't want to enter that by hand every time. So maybe instead you can set set update on value and you see the ORM annotation says pre-update, so on every time it's about to update, it's going to run this function, which is going to set updated on to a new date time. Five minutes. Five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so now it's going to set that on, um, yeah, I did that. Okay. Oh, and here's the reference for that. Um, if you want to learn more about life cycle events, go to docsdoctrineproject.org. Um, that's a really long URL, but I promise I'm going to put these slides up where you can reference them and I'm not going to read that out loud because I'm running out of time. Okay. Um, any last few questions? We have like probably like four and a half minutes now. Yes? One thing I've struggled with is somebody, I've got a lot of background with SQL, but the DQL stuff. I struggled with it a little bit, and I think it was because I would write some DQL and hope that it works, and I couldn't like test it by, a lot of things what I do is I'm like, okay, let's remove all these other stuff, so with SQL, I can just like open up a MySQL client and put the SQL directly into it. And I wondered if you've run into any kind of decent tools or techniques for debugging DQL stuff. I have a really nasty habit of writing my own rather than looking for a tool set. So like uh, in the situation where I'm like, I wonder how this works, let me investigate that. Right. I will just write like a, a simple command and I will just experiment with like different like doctor queries and like selection right. updates and stuff and just have it output into the command line um, and just run it that way. And like, I was a little hacky, but like, yeah. why not? Like, just, you know, just put it, put together some test data, put together some test queries, run it through the command line, have it output either errors or status updates, and go with that. There may be tools available. I don't know. Sorry. No, I guess that's fine. There's no way to get Dr. 
prepared to spit out the sequel though. Uh, it, it can, yeah, it's yeah, just, yeah. it can be, okay. there's some step where it's like, oh yes, here's the SQL. I feel like it could be a little hard to track down, but I think I've actually gotten it to spit it out. Oh, okay. God, so, yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you Oh, I should, no. Is there a function that it'll translate the DQL to SQL so you can see it's where it's the query. Like, for the query, you can say get DQL, and you can also say, like, get connection, get SQL. Um, yeah, you have it. You have so that would be helpful. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's how I thought it was. And then you just right. copy paste it into your. Yeah, yeah it was going to help. Yeah. You, might, you might be able to get it out of the general query line. Yeah, no, that's possible. I could turn the, I could turn the query on if it's not on. But thank you. Any more questions? Can you, can you, you showed examples of one to one and one to many. What about many to many? I'm sure you can do that too, but yeah. Okay. I just want, I was curious if you had seen, uh, it, it sounds like you haven't, but it, if you have not seen, it. does it create its own you have to create it. tables and tables? Yeah, you have to create it. I don't know if that's a good question. Doctor doesn't. Doctor doesn't. Thank you very much.